coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. I don't really care too much about a balanced rod. To me, that balance comes at too high of a cost. What I care more about in a Euro nymphing rod is accuracy and lightweight and sensitivity. And I'm always trying to get more rod speed out of that too. So we'll keep in mind that it, it takes about a nine ounce reel to balance the average, say, 10 and a half foot ESN rod. Um, you're adding three times the weight of your rod in order to achieve balance. That's sort of like taking a three pound baseball bat and adding nine pounds to the handle. You lose control of your striking end of the bat. That was Jeff Sasaki with his take on fly rod balance and his nymphing setup. Going deep on Euro nymphing today and a big chance to win this big trip to the famous Henry's Fork River today on The Swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how you doing today? Thanks for stopping by the show. We just launched a big giveaway uh, going on right now for uh, a trip to the Henry's Fork and the South Fork of the Snake. This is a big trip. We're hitting some of the best rivers in the country, and we are giving away a big prize pack, including including one of the rods and the reels that Jeff talks about today. Uh, we've got another rod we're giving away. Um, we've got a prize pack worth about $6,000. So right now you can go to wetflyswing.com slash giveaway right now, and you can enter to win this giveaway. A really easy chance to do it. There'll be a link in the show notes as well to enter. And, uh, and we are going to have a good time. Also, if you want to just jump in, if you're interested in bypassing the giveaway, uh, and getting involved there, you can just go ahead and uh, and send me an email, Dave at wetflyswing.com, and uh, and I could let you know if we still have a spot available. Today's episode is sponsored by Maverick Fly Fishing. They make the lightest Euro nymphing reel in the world, which makes your rod more sensitive, casting more accurate, and you can hold your dead drifts longer without shoulder burn. Check out Maverick Fly Fishing Stinger and their other Euronymph products and support this podcast by heading over to wetflyswing.com slash maverick right now. That's maverick, M-A-V-R-K, wetflyswing.com slash maverick. Check out the lightest and most unique Euronymphing reel right now. Jeff Sasaki walks us through his Euronymphing setup today and the story behind his famous Stinger reel. We hear about how Jeff got uh, into the fly fishing industry and how he got me into my first cast when we were out there fishing on the river. Uh, we also find out how he transitioned from owning a successful cell phone accessory company into Maverick fly fishing. And we also find out how he fishes dry flies with his Euro niffing setup. Let's go behind the scenes and learn from a really smart engineer who designs really influential products. Here we go, Jeff Sasaki from maverickflyfishing.com. How's it going, Jeff? Pretty good. How you doing, Dave? Great. Great to have you on here today and dig into some of the stuff you have going with uh, Maverick uh, Fly Fishing. You've got some really uh, unique products uh, with a focus in the Euro nymphing space. And we always are excited about Euro nymphing because it's a... Uh, it's such a popular topic with lots of people. It seems like it's one of those topics where you've sometimes got people that are super addicted and then you get people on the other and they're kind of like, uh, you know, nymphing. What, what do you think it is about nymphing? What, what is it that like gets people so fired up or maybe the opposite? I don't know. I think that personally what I've seen is people have trouble with your own nymphing and, uh, and maybe they give it a try and it's not quite what it's, uh, what it, what it's made out to be. Everybody yep. says, oh, you catch so much more fish and this and that, but they actually try it and maybe it's not that productive. And there's a lot to your own nymphing. I mean, it seems really basic and simple, um, but, uh, but there's a lot to it. And I think people, um, people struggle with it, especially the casting. Mm -hmm. and that's probably the biggest thing I see is people, yeah. people struggle with the casting. Yep. You definitely describe my biggest pain because I've been out Euro nymphing a few times. And <laughs> other than the time we went out when I was down at your home waters and we had a great start to the day. I mean, before that, Euro nymphing was always a struggle for me. Yeah, the casting. And I'm not sure what it was that day. Why? Because I remember the last time before that trip, I borrowed my buddy's setup and it was just a nightmare, right? I was trying to cast this thing. It was terrible. What were we doing that day that made things so so much easier? Well, I think what I tell people right off is the first thing is you got to get all the slack out of your line. And even if that means just starting out uh, with some pretty short casts. Um, but the first thing I see is, you know, when you're used to casting line instead of casting the flies, 
you have all that slack in there and with a regular, uh, with shooting line or floating line, um, you know, you can use that, that mass and that's what you're casting. So you can have a bunch of slack out there with your regular line and, and, uh, you know, shoot that thing out there fine. But if you have any slack in the, uh, in the, uh, your own inf line, you know, you'll just whiff it and, and there's no, yeah, there's no transfer of, uh, of energy or power from your rod to, to the actual flies. So I always tell people just, you know, let's just start out, uh, start out really short, um, or start out with a fly downstream. That's always the mm. best thing is throw the fly downstream. The water will catch it, bring it to the top. You don't have to worry about it snagging, but it's going to, it's going to load that, that rod better and just focus. The best way to start is just to, uh, uh, water load it downstream and then just throw that fly upstream. Right. Yeah. I love that you said whiff it. That's a great, uh, <laughs> that's a good marketing thing. Don't whiff it, right? That's, uh, it could be it. Don't whiff it. <laughs> it makes sense to me because I, I played some baseball and definitely, yeah, you don't want to whiff it in baseball or any sport probably. Yeah. And the other thing is when you're, when you feel that heavy line, the weighted line, <clears throat> your casts don't have to be as fast. Oh, and, man. uh, and, and, and to take up, sometimes to take up that thin Euro nymph line to actually feel the, the weight of the fly you do have to cast pretty fast and you got to get that rod speed up there. So, uh, you know, you'll, you'll struggle with that because you're trying to, you're trying to get rod speed up there to, to feel that fly. But if you have slack in the line, that's when you whiff it, you know? Well, this is good. I'm glad we jumped right into it on some of the tips and tricks because we're going to dig into this for, you know, for those that want to up their Euro game. And, uh, but let's go back to your, your products, because I mean, I think that's the thing that stands out here. You have a few things going on. The reel is probably one of the most unique things that most people probably have, if they haven't heard you probably aren't, they don't know what to expect here. So that so we're going to send them over to take a look at this thing. But for those that aren't looking at it right now, describe, uh, the products you have, the, the reel, the, the rods and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, the Stinger micro reel, it's an ultralight, uh, low iner inertia reel. And it was designed specifically for your own inf and tight line techniques where you're elevating line off the water surface, right? So you're using a lot of reach, you're using, um, longer rods and, uh, and you're not, you're, you're getting a better dead drift without letting that line, um, sit on the surface. So you're, uh, you're really working to elevate it. So, so the micro reel was, was designed specifically for that. And, um, uh, so low inertia, um, also improves your casting, improves your dead drifts, and it improves your uh, rod sensitivity. And what is the low inertia? Describe that again. What what is what do we mean by low inertia? Uh, well, inertia is anything with mass has inertia, and uh, once you get that inertia moving, you know, starting and stopping. As we know, you know, casting back and forth. That's starting and stopping. That's a lot of inertia that you're fighting. Mm. So um, it's pretty low profile, and that helps uh, helps the inertia, the uh, rotating inertia because it's just low to the, uh, to the, uh, rod. So basically instead of a spool that spins inside of a cage to take up your line, uh, the stinger is basically a very, it's a elongated spool and you just basically wrap the line onto this open spool, uh, by hand. So there's no moving parts. And, but the whole key again is to keep everything very low profile and very light. Exactly. And it's made out of what, what it described that. Cause it is super light. That's the one thing I noticed when we were fishing, is that, yeah. you know, you, it almost felt like you were just holding a rod without a reel. You know, it was super light. And that's part of the struggle with Euro nymphing, right? Sometimes where you're holding your hand up a lot during the day, so you're getting tired. But that's not the case with this. Right. So it weighs about uh, 1.3 ounces. And a standard reel is about 5 to 8 ounces, maybe 9 with some of these heavier reels. Like I said, it's super low profile. And it's made. we have two models. And one model is a carbon composite. And it's molded. And it's a one piece carbon composite par uh, part. And then, uh, we have, uh, the M one is actually, uh, all CNC machine. So by machining it, we are able to make it in separate components. So the spool itself, uh, can be raised or lowered, uh, if, if maybe you're using a little, um, thicker line or the positioning can be adjusted, um, up or down on your, against your rod handle. So. The aluminum one has a little more adjustability, but they both work exactly the same. They both weigh about the same. Uh, I think the aluminum might, the aluminum one might be about a tenth of an ounce more, but they're very similar. They both they both work the same way. They're super light. Super yeah, light. and and then you have a rod, and you have the whole kind of setup, right? Rod line, everything to go with it to get somebody started. Right, and the stinger works on any rod. It doesn't have to be our rod. 
but um and we we mainly when i went into this i i really was focused on a stinger but uh i decided to come out with my own rod just because i, I realized that people there's people out there who don't have a year in fraud and mm -hmm. it's just easier for them to buy a whole package if they wanted yeah you know or there's people who just buy just a rod right right yeah it is nice having the whole package so you think about it kind of like a, a cartridge system so these are very small they're very light you know instead of uh you can carry a different line or you know like what i like to do is i like to carry different uh, uh leader sizes so i might carry three or four of these with me and each one will have a different leader size one will have maybe a dry fly line on there and then i'll have one with a, a thick leader line i'll have one with a really thin uh, micro leader and then i usually carry one that's a very high vis for if if i get an opportunity to shoot some video um, I like to carry one with a really bright green, like an amnesia leader. So it, it shows up in the video. So I'm usually packing a few of these, but they're pretty small. So yeah. you just kind of throw these on. Right. Small and light. So yeah, you could throw in three or four of these in your, in your, even your vest, right? Or your sling or whatever. And you wouldn't even notice it barely. Right. Right. And, and the whole concept is that ESN line is so light and small. You know, I think to put things in perspective, uh, we sell a, we sell a complete your own line leader system. So it comes everything. It comes with, uh, 50 feet of Euro line. It comes with a 12 foot leader. So I typically run, um, a 20 foot leader. So this, uh, the tracer line kit that comes on our stinger, uh, it starts out with the, the fly line, 50 feet of that. Mm -hmm. And then you've get, and then, um, you've got your, uh, your leader section, which is, uh, either a 15 or a 12 or a 10, uh, depending on wh what you choose. But Typically, the stingers come with a 15-pound butt section, and then it tapers down to a to a 8-pound uh, or a 3x uh, cider section. Yep, the cider. Right, right. Yeah, and I don't think people really – for people who aren't really uh, uh, familiar with uh, your own nymph line, um, the, the line itself is coated. It's it's a level line, and ours is very thin. It's, uh, it's about 17 thousandths of an inch. So, Oh, wow. There you go. What's it made? What is the actual fly line? Because there's different ways to make fly line, right? What What is the actual? This one is a it's a braided core, uh -huh. and it's got a it's got a PVC outer coating, and you want that because um, you want the uh, you want the braided core and the uh, and the PVC coating because that's what helps helps you to hand um, you know, manage your line when you're when you're oh, fighting fish and right. Yeah, I, I've yep. tried. I've tried Just um, the mono fishing with mono and I, I can't do it. I right. just, you know, yeah, yeah. so it's really nice to have that PVC coated and, That's right. but I mean, if you, if you look at, so this, this whole line system, uh, minus the tippet is 62 feet that comes on a stinger. And just to put things in perspective, it comes in a little poly bag and a little header card. And, uh, that poly bag and header card weigh about eight and a half grams and the tracer itself, all 62 feet of it weighs three and a half grams. So that's your whole line. It's super light and thin. I mean, it's lighter than the, the clear poly bag that it comes in. Um, <laughs> wow. A pencil weighs five grams. Jeez, oh, oh, just a regular wood pencil. And the reason that is such a big game changer in when you're Euro niffing is the fact that you're, you need your line to not influence what's going on with your fly, right? Is that the reason that this is so light? Because that's the challenge is that being this light makes it harder to cast, right? Right. It's not so much the line. It's really the leader that, that allows you to elevate it. So the leader systems, you know, they go from everywhere from people are fishing with down to three X all the way to, uh, to, uh, 10 X, 10 pound, oh, yeah, right. 10 pound mono. Yeah. But the, uh, the line itself, that, that helps me a lot because when I'm fishing, I, I tend to cast a lot longer than, um, than normal Euro nymphers, I guess. And I have about 10 to 20 feet outside of my rod tip of, of, uh, ESN line. So I like the super lightweight and you can see it better than, than mono. And, um, it winds onto the stinger better because it's, it's the, uh, braided core versus a nylon core, a mono core. Gotcha. Yeah. The So the braided is better. It's easy. Yeah. And it is when you're taking the reel off, I mean, you can just pretty much just strip it off just like you're stripping line off of a, a, a reel, a circular reel, right? But, and putting it back on, once you get used to it, how long does it take you to get used to kind of wrapping it, right? Putting the line back on. It seemed like for me, it was pretty quick, pretty easy to do. Yeah. Uh, 
I would say within within the first part of your day, you can pretty much figure it out. Um, you just kind of have to look at it and wrap it around and get that muscle memory going. Mm-hmm. And then pretty soon by the end of the day, you're wrapping it without even having to look at it. Yeah. The design, maybe let's talk about that because the design is so unique on how it's not round, right? It's, it's different. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of more rectangular. Describe your background because for some people like myself, you know, designing a product, this would be kind of, I wouldn't even know where to start. Where does the idea come from? But you have some engineering in your background. Maybe let's go back to that real quick. Talk about your engineering background and then we'll take it to why we are using a reel that looks more rectangular than circular. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I spent all of my career as a, as a product designer and, uh, let's see, I started out, um, I started out in, um, transportation design. So I studied transportation and product design in college. And, um, my first job out of college was working for Peterbilt trucks where Mm. I designed, um, aerodynamic, uh, uh, fairings and side skirts and air dams and, and things like that. Yeah. And then, um, and then I had to make a choice whether I wanted to go back to school. If I really wanted to be a car designer, I'd, I can go back to school uh, either in Detroit or uh, maybe Pasadena Art Center in Southern California. But uh, but I decided to to go into tech. Um, being in the Bay Area um, mm-hmm. after school, I, I decided to go into tech, and then um, spent spent a lot of years there, and 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 that was really good because I, I learned a lot about. Uh, product development and, and, and design. And, um, and then after that, uh, I think at the time I was, I was really into, uh, mountain biking, mountain biking scene was, was really big that, and, and that's when I knew I needed to get into, uh, sports and, uh, action sports design. So, uh, so after that, I went to, uh, I went and worked for, um, Fox racing and uh design motocross and i i had grown up riding motorcycles and fishing and just everything outdoors so yeah um at that time there weren't a lot of industrial designers in in sports it was a lot of the graphic designers coming up with the products and it wasn't it wasn't really a a a profession yet in sports um doing things in 3d so uh at Fo- i was the first industrial designer at fox and um and design chest protectors, helmets, and boots, and all that, all the protective stuff. What is um, the industrial? What what makes it industrial designer versus the other type of designer? Uh, graphic designers are doing everything in two D, and industrial designers are working in three D. So we're sketching things out, and then we're going into three D as soon as we can, or we'll start uh, modeling in three D with either oh, foam or clay, gotcha, um, or three D printers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, back then there wasn't. Oh, right, right back then. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so working things out in 3d, um, and then, uh, after, uh, after a lot of years at Fox, I, I decided to go out on my own and, um, be a design consultant. And, uh, and I still do that now, but back then I was working strictly with, um, action sports and bike companies. So I did some work with uh, shift MX and specialized and Troy Lee bell helmets and, and then I, I I did some work with some European companies, Hebo Racing and Gas Gas and Kenny Motocross in France, and uh, did a did a really fun football helmet and shoulder pad project with Reebok. Oh wow! Yeah, at the time they were they had the NFL license. I think now oh. I think I think NFL has is with Nike now, and uh-huh. I can't remember. But anyway, back then it was Reebok. Um, so there were some NFL players wearing your uh, helmet design. No, we didn't go into production with any of that, but they were wearing my glove designs. Oh, okay. Nice. At one point wanted to get into uh protective gear and they owned a couple other companies like CCM hockey and, and, um, so they thought, well, it'd be a na- natural to, to go into uh football helmets and shoulder pads. So, so I worked with them on that, but I, in the end they, they decided that wasn't their space. And mm-hmm. so, yeah. Amazing. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a full career so you pretty much i mean you just described a bunch of different things there and then eventually where the idea of creating this uh you know like we're talking about now we're back to the stinger how does that come to be well even before that i mean there was a there was a lot of years where when my consultancy was was uh kind of drying up where i i noticed some of my clientele were uh, at time let's see i think it was bell helmets i had most of my work with them and uh 
my projects were starting to slow down. And this was about the time of the recession, 2009 recession. Mm -hmm. So I felt that and everyone was pulling their projects and, um, and I had, a, I had a lot of time in the way. So I was riding my mountain bike and dirt bike a lot. And, um, I, uh, let's see. Oh, I know I was, I was breaking my phones a lot back then. Mm. Uh, I was crashing or I, or I had this crazy dog too. this, uh, this, uh, um, blue healer that would chew up everything that I put my <laughs> hands on every time I turn around, he'd, you know, or left the house, he'd chew up a remote or a phone. And I have, yeah. a, I had a whole box of these. So, um, and it, that was about the time that the iPhone was coming out and I really wanted an iPhone, but I, I knew that that dog would chew it up. So, um, having more time than anything else, I went into the shop and I machined out a, an aluminum case for it and it, it came out pretty cool. And, uh, so I spent the next, the next, uh, years just, uh, developing this company where I sold just high end machined, uh, iPhone cases. And, uh, so the first one was aluminum, but, but we made them out of G10 and carbon fiber. And, uh, at, at one point we had some with titanium and, they were just very exotic, exotic materials. And, um, yeah, that, that, that went on for a long time. And then, um, and then I sold the company to a company down in San Diego and, uh, and that's when, uh, I knew I wanted to get out of tech. So I started to transfer out of tech and decided it was time to, uh, to, uh, move up to trucking and just do some, uh, dirt biking and fishing. There you go. That's yeah, amazing. So, and why why Truckee? Why why had just less people, or why Truckee? Well, is it, Truckee is somewhere that I've always, I, I'd always come to, to uh, on my weekends when I was in the Bay Area, and uh, so my wife and I bought a a, a rental house here, and we we'd rent it out vacation rental, and then we'd come here on weekends, and then when I had when I sold the company uh, Element Case, and I moved to San Diego. Um, we would come back to Truckee, um, once a month and I would just, you know, and I'd get to stay here for maybe a week, w work out of the house, but I really just, I just fish, fish my butt off and rode every day. And, uh, and that's when I decided, yeah, I, I, I just don't want to work anymore. I don't want to, you know, as good as the job was in San Diego and, um, as well as the company was going after I transferred it over to the, the new owners, um, I could have stayed there, but yeah, we just we just decided we wanted to be back in in Truckee. There you go. And I was just looking at the uh yeah, Element Case. I mean, that was your company that it's still going, right? Elementcase.com. It's the, the ultimate tactical phone case. Is that the same same brand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was really because uh you know, we did everything out of uh exotic materials. We had our we had our line that was really exotic woods and finishes, you know, uh, um but, but I think our more popular stuff was all the tactical stuff and the mm -hmm. G 10 and, and all that stuff. And a lot of that stuff we had to figure out with machining because some of the stuff that we were machining for small parts on a, on a phone case, machine shops didn't know how to do that. And we really had to work with them. And, and at the time we were working with quite a few different machine shops, some specialized in G 10, some specialized in titanium, you know, and, and, you know, aluminum. So mm, gotcha. we really had to yeah, develop some of those processes with them. But, uh, yeah, after the company was sold, I, I was, uh, I was pretty done. You know, we had mm -hmm. sold our house in the Bay area and, um, we were loving San Diego, but just coming back to Truckee, um, once a month, I just, just felt like that's, that's where I needed to be. There you go. So back to Truckee and, and that's a perfect transition because we were, when we met out there, we fished, what, what, what uh, was the river we fished? Was that, we fished, it was just mainly the, the Truckee, right? The main, yeah, the, yeah. the big Truckee. There's the big Truckee and then there's the, the tributaries that, that run into the big Truckee. There's the little Truckee and there's mm -hmm. Prosser Creek that comes out of uh, Prosser Reservoir. And there's a lot of smaller, really fun uh, creeks and, and rivers to fish as well. The big Truckee's, um, that that's the big that's the more famous river though that runs from Lake Tahoe all the way to runs about 120 miles all the way to uh, Pyramid Lake in the uh, in the Great Basin. Mm -hmm. So a lot of a lot of miles to fish. Yeah, and that is the, the yeah Pyramid. I always forget about that that it's it's all connected right to Pyramid, which has the crazy uh, huge uh, cutthroat right Lahat and cutthroat. And you were just up there on a recent trip. Yeah, it's it's pretty close to, to Truckee. So I can okay. go over there. I can just make a day trip and, 
and go fish. Yeah. And it is in Nevada, but Nevada uh, fishing game don't have anything to do with it. It's all um, reservation um, reservation land. I think it's the Paiute tribe mm -hmm. that controls all that. So so you just have to pay a, a fee to them and uh, and you can fish all day and camp, whatever. Yeah, right. It's all good to go. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun though. Did, how was your trip? You guys made it out there? Did you uh, have any action or was there a lot of what would it look like out there? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm pretty new to pyramid fishing, but it's it's fairly basic. I mean, you just get a, you just, I just went out there with a seven weight um, in a sinking line and uh, and it's, it was, it's really hard to cast that into the wind yeah, <laughs> and you're, right. it's pretty, it's pretty windy and rough out there. And you're on a ladder? Um, no, no, I was, no. we were on the rocks. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so I was having trouble with that and, and the friends I go with are, they're really good at it and they, they use uh, switch rods. And, uh, the first time I went, I didn't have a switch rod. So I borrowed my friend's extra rod and I was able to cast it a little further out. And it's not that the fish are really far out there. It's just that if you can cast it out there, it's all about just getting that, getting the time for that bobber to float, you know? And uh, before the wind brings it back into the into oh. the shore, and you got recast. Oh wow! Right, so it's blowing at you the whole time. So it's just blowing in your bobber and <laughs> yeah, so it's just blowing the bobber towards the towards the shore. Right. And, and these have... fish are just like sitting off a ledge, just kind of migrating down there. Yep, exactly. They're just right off the ledge, so they don't have to be very far out. But if you can cast it far, then you don't have to cast as much. So, so it's bobber fishing. You're just watch. You're watching this bobber, but it's just like um, you know, when you're euro nymphing, you're just you're just hyper focused on that cider line yeah but in at pyramid you're just focused on that bobber and waiting for that thing waiting for that thing to go down yep but um you know so i would say technically it's not as hard but the fish are really are really big we're catching you know fish that are seven eight nine right. pounds cutthroat which is which is yeah really cutthroat right now they're not the original strain of cutthroat the the original strain of cutthroat from pyramid lake um and back in the, at the turn of the century, um, those were the original cutthroats and they were, they were so big, they were called a uh, uh, super trout. Hmm. And I, I, I saw one picture that says it was some kind of advertisement and it was said the biggest trout in the world. And, um, and it was a really old black and white photo. And so what happened was at the turn of the century, right around uh, 1908 or so, they started to build dams in the Truckee River so the fish couldn't go up to spawn. And, uh, and then Pyramid got so popular that fishing companies sprang up and they just overfished the place. Yeah. And I think by 1941, there was no more cutthroat. Wow. It had been extinct. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. So, there you go. um, and then so they they tried to bring the cutthroat back, but they didn't have the original strain. So they did repopulate other strains of cutthroat, and I and there's some there's some uh, rainbows in there and and other fish, but that original super trout was was gone. And then um, and then there was a, a BLM biologist in uh, Idaho, and he at the same time was trying to bring back a population of what was called the Bonneville cutthroat. Mm -hmm. in in some of the lakes over there because they had become extinct but re remember thousands of years ago this was all one big body of water oh, so wow. he knew that he knew that he could find that original strain of bonneville cutthroat if he went looking in the little streams and creeks way way out in the in the hills so while he was looking for it he found a fish and he took it to his fish biologist friend and they said that they thought that this was the original um strain of pyramid lake cutthroat so but that that was like 1974 75 so they didn't have any way to prove it but they did take that fish and they 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 started to um plant uh not plant them but they started to uh to uh keep them alive and they kept them in tanks and then and then nothing happened for a long time and then um just uh about 15 years ago um with DNA testing, they took samples from a, from a uh, museum and they took the samples that this one uh, BLM guy uh, caught that strain of fish and they compared them and realized it was the same. It wow. was the same fish. Same fish. Yeah. Jeez. So they, <laughs> so they re so cool. started to repopulate um, 
this cutthroat was um was found this little fish it was really tiny and it was found in a really little stream where they found it was called pilot peak this mountain range and this uh, fish was found on the nevada side of this mountain range and so that's that's where it came from so they repopulated it and now these fish are growing in pyramid lake they're growing over 10 pounds uh, well actually over 20 pounds yeah the biggest one i caught was a little over was a little under nine pounds dang but it's you know that's a big fish yeah gosh and what, what was that one how'd that feel getting that nine pounder in yeah that was uh it's it's crazy it's just to, to pull in a fish that big is is fun but to think that to think that people are catching 20 pounders and that yeah. within they say within maybe as early as 10, 10, 15 years, you know, that fish could, could get back to its original, uh, super trout weight of 40 pounds. Oh, wow. That's what they were. They were 40 pounders in there. Yeah. There was a record of people catching them at 40, 41 pounds. Wow. Yeah. So why it's always interesting. Like why the 40 pound, why, why is that the only place you see? Well, it's not the only place, but you don't see a lot of 30, 40 pound fish trout around the, the country, right? You, yeah. Yeah. Like, I guess there's just a lot of food there. Would you know what's going on there? I guess it's, yeah, it's, it must be just the food source. And, yeah. uh, and I think I Lake know, Tahoe used to have cutthroats that were pretty big too. So, so they used to spawn yeah. and go up and down the Truckee river. But I think at one point I read that they had built, you know, during the whole lumber, um, they used to use the, the Truckee river for a while as a, as a logging flume sure. to get all the sure. logs down to, yeah. uh, to the to nevada and the, and the comstock Splash load and stuff like that yeah so at one point there was 30 to 40 dams oh, so yeah. there really Just is no there were yeah there was no way that the, no. those fish were going to continue to to uh spawn no, and got hammered got right hammered. right right so they're saying now that that original strain of cutthroat is moving up the Truckee river oh so there's another so the pilot peak or pilot butte is in there but there's another strain that's in the Truckee moving up yeah so they repopulated cutthroats in there but the original Pilot Peak is the one that is the newest one that they found in in Nevada, and mm -hmm. um, I I have caught both, and I I can say that it seems like the Pilot Peak ones are a little stronger or more powerful. He was taking my rod to the left and then to the right, and then I'd go, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't really know where I was going to land him because he was kind of going back and forth. Whereas the other fish I caught, um, which which looked different, they're they're more brown. Um, yeah, they didn't seem to fight as hard, but. You know, I'm I'm pretty new at this uh, still water yeah. game, so I mean, right. it's, they're big fish, but you know, you know what it's like to catch a you know a 20 inch trout, much yeah. smaller, but 20 inches in a river. There's so oh, much yeah. more. It's yeah, they're strong, and they're you've got the water and the rocks, and there's just so yeah. much more going on to you know to bring in a you know exactly. a 20 incher in in the river. So today's episode is sponsored by Maverick Fly Fishing. They make the lightest zero nymph reel in the world, which makes your rod more sensitive, casting more accurate, and you can hold your dead drifts longer without the shoulder burn. This reel is so unique, you may not even recognize it as a fly reel. I had a chance to fish the stinger reel with Jeff on his home river on the Truckee. The biggest thing that I remember is the weight. The weight really stuck out because you can't even barely tell there's a reel. It's essentially kind of like you're holding a rod all day long i mean it's that light and uh and when you're euro nipping that is a key and the other big thing i remember from that day was catching uh, a fish on my first cast pretty cool to be down in that part of the country and, and have some great success with jeff maverick keeps things simple by offering a euro nymph product line with essentials you'll need from rod reel fly line and leader system Euro nymphing doesn't have to be complicated, so let Maverick Fly Fishing get you started right now. You can learn more by checking out Maverick's YouTube channel for some tips and tutorials. And you can also head over right now to wetflyswing.com slash maverick to check out the good stuff they have going. That's Maverick, M-A-V-R-K, wetflyswing.com slash maverick to support this podcast and take a look at one of the most unique and efficient Euro nymphing setups on the market. Okay, back to the show. Well, let's, let's take it back to Euro nymphing real quick because, uh, you know, I, I think we want to focus on that as far as, you know, again, and part of this is people, like you said, the challenge is that it is, there is a learning curve. 
What do you think, you know, as far as like what you're doing, how is what you're doing differently from some of the other stuff out there? Because you've got a bunch of different things, a lot of people, some big names in the Euro niffing space. How do you think, you know, what you do is a little bit different out there? Uh, well, let's see. I think that the Truckee River is pretty unique and it's, it's not an easy, it's, it's one of the, you know, hardest rivers in the West to, to fish. And so you have to have a lot of, I think you have to have a lot of tools in your bag, I guess. And mm-hmm. Euro nymphing kind of provides that, but I've had to actually expand even more. Um, I think what I do that's a little bit more, a little different is, is I focus on lightweight and getting those longer dead drifts and uh, getting my rod to perform better, more accurately. Um, I feel like I'm casting longer. Mm-hmm. And and I know that, you know, Euro nymphing is based on more vertical line presentation and, and, um, and getting straight down to the fish. But in the Truckee River, it's got a lot of mixed currents. And if I see a pocket that's maybe 40 feet away, I'm not going to pass it up because I don't have the perfect drift. I'd still rather hit that with a Euro nymph rig and get my fly into that pocket than walk away from it or to try to, you know, like there's no way I can get Sneak a floating line. It. Right, yeah. right. And and there's some areas of the Truckee where you just you just can't fish it because it's too far away or it's too, um, you know, you can't wade to it certain times of the year when the water's just too fast or, but I'll still, I'll still fish it. And the only way to do it is, is with long casting. So, hmm. so I, I, I haul my casts a lot to try to get that thing out there. And, um, I know a lot of people don't really do that, but that's, that's the only way I can, I can get that fly that far. Um, if you have a more vertical presentation of your line, your, your fly definitely is going to drop faster into that, into that strike zone. But I would rather have some of my leader because a far cast, your, your line angle is going to be a lot lower, right? So you're mm-hmm. going to have more, more line laying on the water, but I would still rather have to be able to reach that spot. I'd still rather fish it and have some of my cider on the water or some of my, my um, leader on the water than to walk away and not fish that area. So that is the idea. Yeah. You, and we were doing that, I think, when we were out there. I mean, I know I remember one spot where I got a pretty nice fish and I was casting over towards, you know, there's a rock on the other side and I was trying to hit this little slot. I remember I picked one up there. I think you probably yeah. did too, right? That was one of those ones where I can't remember how far that cast was, but it was a, you know, a nice little cast. It wasn't like we we're fishing 10 feet out in front of us, right? No, it was it was a lot farther than what mo- most Euro Nymphers would fish. Yeah. And, and, you know, we were just hauling our casts, you know, we were just mm-hmm. pushing that thing out there and, uh, having a little leader floating on the water is still not, is still a lot better than having a bunch of floating line on the water that you have to mend or, you know, yeah. so it may not be ideal Euro nymphing technique, but it's better than not fishing it for me. Mm-hmm. So I do that a lot. The other thing I do is, is, um. And especially lately is I, I've been experimenting with a lot of ways to cast dry flies with a, with a Euro nymph rig. Mm, right. Yeah. How do you do that? Because you don't have weight, right? That's part of the thing you need is weight. Well, there's a, there's a lot of ways to do it. And, um, it also depends on what leader formula. If, if I'm using a heavy leader, let's say like on the 20 pound to 15 pound leader range, I can, I can cast I can load the rod with that light leader and throw some dries out there, but it's not going to be very far. You know, it might be a 20 foot cast or something like that. But depending on the condition, I can get a fly out. I can get dry flies out there farther if I use what I call a transport fly. And that's basically a weighted fly. And depending on, depending on the water condition, I'll use a transport fly that's a, a perfect transport fly to me. What I use a lot is a mop fly. Oh, mop fly. Okay. Yeah, because a mop fly a mop fly is really heavy when it's wet because it's basically a sponge or a mop, right? Mm-hmm. So you, you it casts really far. But then as soon as it hits the water, it's pretty buoyant or not buoyant, but it's pretty buoyant neutral. Mm. So it doesn't sink. Oh, wow. So you, you can throw the sink pretty far and then you can... Um, you can use that as your, your anchor fly. And then above it, a couple of feet, you can put a dry fly and you can dangle that fly on the top or dance it on the top, or you can just let it sit there and drift. 
So you put the mop on the head or on the main fly as your mop fly. And then above that would be a dropper with your dry. Yeah. I've done it both ways. Like the main thing is that you get the weight of that water to, to cast that, it, right. the light fly out there. Right. And then dry dropper is a good way too. It's just dry dropper mm. flies tend to be very, um, they're not very aerodynamic. So it is hard to, to a fish, um, dry dropper with a big, uh, dry fly. But it's doable. Again, it all depends on the river condition because sometimes I don't have to cast it that far. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But as I've gone to thinner and thinner leaders, um, like now I'm fishing, say my my average leader that I fish now is maybe like a 10-pound mono instead of a 15 or a 20. And with light leaders, um, I'm able to cast farther and suspend that line above the water right because i like to cast far mm -hmm. so i can suspend it above the water better with a with a super light leader and people now are fishing micro leaders I, i've tried going down to 3x and 4x on my leaders but but uh it's it's a little bit too much trouble for me so i stick with about 10 to about eight and i taper it down to six so that's a really good light leader and the problem though is those techniques I just talked about, about with throwing a dry fly, it gets even harder with the light leader. Mm, right, the micro leaders. Yeah, yeah. Which are just super, even thinner than normal leaders. Right, right. So I guess my advice would be, if you want more control of your flies, go with the heavier leaders, 20 to 15 pound. And 15 to 12 is a good all around. If you're gonna throw dry flies, if you're gonna throw dimps, you can still suspend it pretty far out there. And then if you're going to fish farther distance, say you're fishing a, a, a bigger river with more, uh, um, and you, you have to hit some pockets maybe on the other side, then go to the smaller leaders. So big leaders for the small streams and dries, small leader, micro leader for the long distance and, and bigger water. That's, that's kind of yeah. my general rules. Okay. But Lately, though, what I've been doing is sometimes I'll take multiple rods, but if I only have my micro leader set up with me or my small leader, you can actually weight the the leader section with with weight and get that to cast pretty far. Mm. And so, like a split shot, like just put a split shot on there or something. Um, I, I used to do that. The problem with split shot is if you, if you mount it too high onto your leader, you can't get it through your guides, right? So you'd have to put it oh. on very loosely. And then if you do uh, catch a fish, it'll slide, right? It won't, it won't get caught. Yeah. So I have one technique for what, what I was doing for a while was I'd put a piece of little tape and adhesive, and then I put the split shot on really lightly, but, um, but then you got to reset it every time. So what I do now is I take, um, uh, and again, this is just for super light, light leaders. And if I want to throw a dry fly, um, what I'll do is I'll take uh, loon, uh, loon tungsten putty. Mm -hmm. And I'll tear off a piece that's about the size of a small, of a, of a split shot, maybe, like, maybe like two and a half millimeters or maybe three millimeters. Mm-hmm. And then what I'll do is I'll take little pieces of that, maybe three or four, and I'll, I'll spread those onto my, my leader. And you have to play with different spacing or whatever, but this stuff isn't like dissolve. It doesn't dissolve in the water. It's kind of like um, gum that's been stuck on the bottom of a, <laughs> a chair or a desk, oh, yeah. right? It's, it's a, uh, gets hard it's kinda, a little bit. It's hard and it's kind of waterproof. So you have to kind of knead it to get it soft. Mm -hmm. But then you can take the smallest of piece and almost it's not even round at that point. You just kind of spread it on. And, um, and now a fly, a, like a, even a really small, um, uh, say a little dry mayfly, you know, number 16, uh, I can throw that now with the weight of that leader almost twice as far as if I were just trying to throw it with a, with a leader right. by itself. Wow. And it's not, it's not a pretty cast, but it does get out there. And surprisingly that leader, because this weight is so small, it's enough to cast it out there, you know, maybe 35 feet, but it doesn't sink, you know, because it's all nylon, right? Your leader's all nylon. So it doesn't yeah. really sink. 
Right. And his pieces wow. are so small. So yeah, you can just huh. dead drift this thing along. There you go. So that I would, I guess getting back to your question, I'd say versatility, you know, trying to do everything, a lot of things with one or two rods, you know, trying to fish mm -hmm. longer than making this just the short game. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, those are big. Those are huge because I mean, it gives you, you know, and we talk about Euro nymphing, right? That's a one, you know, general name for something, but there's a lot of different ways to do it. Right. You can, and we're talking about some, some different things to do. What is the, um, with the stinger, um, Talk about how it improves kind of uh, just if you're out there, you're niffing. Describe that kind of the casting, the sensitivity yeah. versus say, what else would somebody be using okay. just like a small reel, right? Yeah. The alternative is a, is a small reel, but um, small reels can be a pain because, well, for one, you still have inertia. Unless your reel is really light, you still have that rotating inertia. So basically uh, by reducing weight and inertia, the stinger improves your casting, your dead drift, and your rod sensitivity. The more you reduce your reel weight, or the more you reduce uh, weight and inertia, the better your rod performs. So, well, so let's talk about casting. Um, yeah. We know that casting is kind of a start and stop motion, right? Mm -hmm. If you think back to your, your physics in high school, force equals mass times acceleration, the more mass of your reel, the more force it takes to start and stop it. So that's, that's when you're wearing out your arm. That, so that's one thing. Right. Um, yeah. And the other thing is when that mass is localized opposite your rod tip, the more difficult it is to control the movement of your rod tip. It's basically fighting the rod tip. Mm -hmm. So you've seen these slow motion videos of a really good caster, right? Uh, he's, he's got a really nice forward stroke or she, yeah. um, the rod is fully loaded. Yeah. Um, and then, and then the angler throws a nice haul into the cast and then a nice hard stop at two o'clock or is that 10 o'clock, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the rod tip continues to bend down and the line's shooting out. And then what do you see? The rod springs back up. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it bends back down and then it bends back up and then this undulation keeps going and each time it's creating a waveform in the line and you can see this waveform right because this is all slow motion yep so the reel is causing more than 50 percent of that waveform hmm. and here's what's happening um we've all had a felt a rod right we've taken a rod and a, and a rod chop and we've given a couple of flicks right yeah Right, and then the we, rod shake, the shop right, rod it, shake. Exactly, the rod <laughs> shake. Yeah. <laughs> and we bought that rod, and it was the one we thought was the best, and yeah. we, we got it out on the river, and it's like, what the heck? You know, it just doesn't feel the same. Didn't have that same motion yeah. after we put the line and, and, and the reel on. So anyway, what's happening in that, in that scenario with the video is uh, Newton's first law is objects in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by by another force, right? Hmm. So you've got all this inertia in your reel. So try this at home. Go ahead and give it the rod shake that you gave it to in, in the shop and notice how long it takes for that rod tip to settle and stop. Mm, you know, it, right. it may take about three seconds or so depending on how hard you flick it. Yeah. And then, and then attach your reel and do the same thing. Mm. And then you'll notice that now it's taking maybe six seconds. And if you think about what's going on, you've got, a counterweight opposite your rod you've got you've got inertia in the rod and when you give it a flick the stiffness of the rod is going to bring it back to zero uh, eventually but if you've got this reel that is doing the opposite and your your hand is the fulcrum it's going to keep going you know so so the reel it's kind of like well it's kind of like the tail wagging the dog you know yeah it keeps it, it keeps it moving gotcha and then it gets worse if you add a little bit of side to side motion to it. I mean, so far what we were talking about was a cast that was straight in one plane. But if you have any kind of side to side motion, now you have something else going on and that, and that's called rotational inertia. Mm -hmm. So that's where your, your reel is trying to rotate around the center axis of the rod. So, um, another thing you can try at home is take your rod and write your signature in cursive. And do that a few times, kind of get used to the way the rod wiggles and moves. It's a good idea. That's a that, well, that's one I haven't done. Right, write your name in cursive. <laughs> yeah, write write your big your name in yep. big cursive letters okay. and against the wall where you can kind of see the rod tip. Yeah, and then um, 
What's it going to do when you do that? What's what's the rod tip? Gonna, how's that different from the rod shake? Well, what you're going to see is once you put the reel on, that cursive got almost unrecognizable. Oh, really? So you couldn't do it. So you couldn't sign your name with the reel on really accurately. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's. you'll see that the, the reel, when you start adding like more of a side to side motion, now you've got two things happening. You've got forward back inertia and you've got rotational inertia mm-hmm. and your signature starts to get worse. Right. And that all leads to, like we're talking about the the whole idea of it's already a challenge because these light lines casting. So any slack or anything you add to it is a challenge. So you're saying basically with, with your reel setup, you're making it easier to cast essentially. And, and at first, is that true? Because for me, I feel like I only have good thoughts of that day. It feels like, again, let's go back to my, my claim to fame. First fish, first cast, right? I got one. Was that, first of all, was that just lucky? And then um, I felt like I was casting good that day. Do you remember that at all? Well, it could be luck, but I mean, because it never happens on the Truckee River, especially, it's such a hard place to fish. I always tell my friends when I go out, okay, it's the first time on this river and it's the first cast of the day. You only have one chance to do one thing and that's catch a fish. So just, just like anybody else, I told you that same yep, thing you did. and you caught a fish. But what was surprising was you caught like two or three fish right after that on your second and I think yep. your fourth cast. Right. And so that was, that's pretty unusual. That I don't cool. know if it has anything to do with your, your rod and reel setup, but it really was something I've never seen before on the Truckee River. And yeah. I, I was pretty. That was amazing. Cause that was the first, I, I that may have been the first Euro nymph fish I've caught. Uh, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's how interesting it was. And so, and then we had a good day. We went out, like we we're saying, we hit some other spots and we, we definitely got in some fish. Do you feel like yeah. um, the Truckee is a really technical, a super technical river that a lot of people are challenged with or, or are there places where you can get some good action? Yeah, it's, it's pretty tough. It's, um, it's a very mixed current water and um, the conditions change every day, mm. like a lot. It's not like a spring creek where it's, oh, everything's right. the same, the temperatures are the same. Truckee is always changing because you've got, you've got, it's, it's one of the coldest places in the country, average temperature, which means, and you know, it's, it's very hot and warm and sunny there, but that means that at night it's getting really cold. Yeah. Uh, right in this area, especially down in the canyon. So the water temperature is changing drastically. And then you've got all the water flows from all of the reservoirs around it. Yeah. Uh, Prosser and Donner and Lake Tahoe and, and a stampede and air, the, all those cha- uh, flows are changing and things just change a lot. And then you got, you got snow melt. You've got all the snow that is, is uh, on our hills and then we'll get a nice warm day. And then all of a sudden, you know, we've got, we've got all this runoff. Oh, so, right. And the river blows out. Is that pretty common? Yeah, it could blow out, but it could just just be enough just to where it looks great, but the fish just aren't. Just a little too not. warm, or the cha- something changed a little too much. Yeah, I think I think the fish just don't don't like the change, and I think there's a lot of change in Truckee. And then and then also, you know, we don't plant fish here. This is all wild trout. Mm. And then for some reason, we have this, we have California uh, Fish and Game um, makes it legal to harvest fish in, in some parts of the Truckee River. Hmm. So those are wild. So all those fish are just wild fish. Right, right. So they're all wild. Hmm. Um, there's certain areas. Um, there's one small section where uh, a private land where they, where they plant some fish. And there might be some fish that come in through the reservoirs because they plant in the reservoirs. But for the most part, the Truckee River is as nice and as fishy as it looks. I just, I don't think there's as many fish here. And, um, yeah. you know, we've got people taking them out and harvesting them. Yeah. And then we've got, and the fish here are really smart and really spooky. So, uh, yeah, so, so it's a tough place to fish. So, you know, the way, how we did that day was, was a really good day. Yeah. I have an understanding with the fish in the Truckee. It's like, Hey, you know, if I'm out here, you don't have to take my flies very much. I can get skunked as much as you want, but if I come out here with a friend or, <laughs> or, or someone, yeah. I want you to, you know, I want you to, to uh, get some action. Get some we, action. we need some action. <laughs> That's right. We need some action. That's good. Well, it was, it was definitely a fun day. It was, it was good to get out there and um, yeah, I mean, I think that, and that's something we'll probably be talking about at a later point as we're put some stuff together. I think we're going to have a little, um, something to give people listening, maybe an opportunity to get out in that part of the world. And I'm sure, I know we have a lot of people that listen from around, you know, California as well. 
So I'm sure um, there'll be a good chance to connect with some people. What has been, yeah. you know, because your rod is so, well, your reel really is so unique, the whole thing. What, what's been, have you had any feedback kind of negatively or positively, any pushback on what it is? Because I'm sure people see this thing and they're like, what the heck is this? Like, are you trying to change what fly fishing is, right? What, talk about that a little bit. Well, first, it's it may be unique, but it's not it's not a problem that, none of us have recognized before mm. right i mean we've all mm-hmm. felt that it's just up until now um there was no real need to change it but uh lampson came out with a reel and um it's called the center axis mm-hmm. and their their intent was to do the same thing to reduce that rotational inertia of the reel so their reel is really cool it's it's in line with the with the rod axis so the spool is directly in the center of the of the axis and again that was exactly the same thing that i'm trying to achieve is is to reduce that rotational um inertia so kudos to them yeah how does that describe that the center axis? i'm just trying to picture a normal reel it seems like now how is that center axis different from say uh just your standard reel well a standard reel fits on a standard reel seat on any rod and it's offset. And the the formula of that to that is I equals MR squared. So I is the inertia, the amount of force, M is the real mass, and R squared is the radius or the distance from the center of the axis of the rod, right? So the more mass you have, the more inertia, um, and R squared, the more distance you have, the more inertia you have. So so what Lampson is doing is is they're putting the the center, uh, oh. they're putting the real weight right in the center. I see it now. Yeah, I wasn't thinking that. Wow. So is this is this Lampson real? Is this out there? Yeah. So it's a rod and reel combo, oh, yeah. and they've rethought the whole thing. Wow. This is. I mean, this thing. I wouldn't say this looks as unique as uh, unique as your reel, but it is a unique looking uh, reel. Yeah, because I see what it is. I mean, literally the reel. It almost looks like it's molded into the middle of the of the rod and the reel seat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the thinking is there to get rid of that rotational inertia, and I'm sure it it works way better than oh, you know right. a regular rod reel. But the one thing that it can't address is the mass of the reel itself is still pretty heavy. So right. even though they've eliminated the rotation around the center axis, they haven't eliminated the inertia around the fulcrum of your hand. So basically, the forward back motion, right? You still got that mass swinging around your your handle yeah you still got the mass right right so that's creating inertia in in another way but they've eliminated the inertia in the uh center axis uh direction Mm. this is some high level stuff that's what's cool about this is that it takes a a smart person like yourself to describe it you know and it's uh because this is not uh i mean it seems like it is kind of close to rocket science we always joke about that right but this is how technical is this stuff you're talking about here as far as the you know some of these equations and things like that it's all basic physics it's just no one there was no way to there was no need to uh you know to to try to solve these issues um until now the stinger doesn't work with any kind of fly fishing except for uh euronymphene. Oh really? Yeah, I mean I use it for dry fly fishing and especially with my small rods. If I have a my my small light fiberglass stream rod, it works really good. But you're not really with floating line, you're not really elev- elevating your line above the water as much, right? You're right. So yeah. you get the benefits of the casting, you still feel they're really good. Your rod's doing what it's supposed to do without that inertia. But but what you don't see is the advantage of, uh, or you don't take advantage of, of the thing being light and you can elevate it like in, in your own nymphing. Your own nymphing, you know, you're just, you're just working so much harder. You're casting more, you're, you're dead drifting longer. You're just working your arm so much more. And in dry fly, you can throw that nice fly, a dry line out there and you can just kind of kick mm-hmm. back and rest for a while, right? Mm-hmm. So with dry line, it only casts better. It doesn't, it's not going to improve your dead drift. It's not going to do it. You still got to mend, you know? So, so anyway, yeah. that, and that's why I focused on a stinger being just a tool for, uh, for, um, Euro nymphine. Gotcha. 
No, this is great. I think we're I think we're shedding some light. I think we've hit some of the high points of, you know, what it is, why you you've designed what you've designed, this unique product. Um, anything else you want to give a heads up before we start to take it out of here as far as, you know, the real the rotting of your products, anything you might have coming or, you know, how does it look to you? It seems like that you've got this thing and part of the challenge is really getting people to maybe get the thing in their hands and get a feel for it, right? How do you, how do you solve that problem for somebody that still has questions? Yeah, I would say do exactly what I said. Um, take your rod, take the reel off. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, basically it's what I did back when I was trying to solve this problem. I remember reading an article on a, on a rod designer and when he tests his prototypes, he takes his reel off and he, and he sets it on the ground and then he casts his pro his prototypes. And so that's what I did. I took my reel off and I fished, I fished a day with the, with the reel in my waders. And, um, you know, especially if, when you're old nymphing, you're not really, you're not really, um, putting fish on the reel as much you're on him pretty tight and and you can you know you're always usually just stripping the fish yeah. in right yeah you are. so yeah rarely do you have a so trout. yeah that's the thing rarely is a trout i mean unless you're maybe at somewhere where you're catching 20 pounders but a lot of the time yeah you're just stripping the trout in and that's usually the best way to do it because get them on the reel that's kind of a hassle anyways and if you can get them in strip and that gets them in faster Right, exactly. And uh, especially, I mean, I, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes um, that people make, whether you, they're Euro nymphing or any kind of fly fishing. The biggest mistake I see people make is, is they get a strike and they don't know what to do. Mm. Like, you know, especially if the fish starts to come to you, they don't right. have that stripping skill. And that's, yep. that's like the essential skill you need is as soon as you feel that strike and you put pressure on that fish, if there's not enough pressure on him, you have to strip, right? Yeah. Especially if that fish starts coming towards you. Right. There's no way a reel can keep up, can go that fast. You have to strip yep. as fast as you can. That's Sometimes, right. you know, you know, it takes three, four strips, five strips before you get that pressure on him. Yep. That's right. So, so I would say, you know, see what your rod feels like without, without the reel and, um, mm -hmm. and do some of the things I said, you know, try to see what what it feels like with a reel and without. So you can kind of understand the, the benefits uh, and, you know, what inertia is actually doing to you, uh, to your casting or, or whatever. Yeah. Try to imagine what it would be like to, to fish a rod that was just, just your rod it, by itself. Um, that's, that's my goal is to get, to get the system down to where it's, uh, three ounces total, uh, real rod and reel, you know, and again, real companies didn't do anything wrong. They've done things right for a long time. There's only one reason that the stinger works, and that's because this new thing, your own nymphine. Right. Um, because with your own nymphine, I don't need a drag system. I'm on the fish so fast that the fish don't have time to run. It's it's a different kind of fishing. It's not like you throw a bunch of floating line out there, and then the fish takes your fly, and he takes off with it. Now you've got a running fish, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen in your own nymphine. You're on him so fast. You know, of course, you get into a a powerful fish and he's going to start fighting you and he's going to start jerking and you got to, you got to modulate that line and let him go sometimes, or sometimes you got to let him go around a rock or whatever. But you know, in your own thing, you just don't let a fish, you don't let a fish run. So you don't need that drag. So it's like if you were, if you're walking a, a dog, right, you got this powerful big dog, a Rottweiler or something, right. And he tends to take off. Well, if he takes off and you've got this long 20 foot leash, you're in trouble, right? You oh, better yeah. just let go it's of that thing. Tricky, right. 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 But if you keep him tight, he feels the control. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so as soon as he starts to do something, you give him a nudge and you're tight right on him. Yeah. He's, he's not going to, he's not going to run. So I kind of see fish the same way. Don't let them run. I never, I try never to let a fish run. Um, and we talked about how light that your own inf line is. So, mm -hmm. so I don't need, a big capacity spool, my, uh, you know, you don't need very much reel to hold line and leader that that's three grams, right? It's so small. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's it. And I keep thinking, you know, when I first started hearing about your and I remember it was always the, you know, you heard a lot, the complaint about the rod. I even, we've talked about some people over the years with about that, like, Oh gosh, how do you, 
how do you deal with your arm getting tired? You know, like you're holding your rod up all day. Do you have to hold your rod up all day? Is that a requirement? Can you Euro nymph without holding your rod? But, <laughs> but basically what you're saying is here, I mean, you could hold your rod up all day with this setup. That, like literally the few ounces of a, having a reel makes a difference. Is that kind of what you're saying? Well, you could hold your lo- arm up longer. And if, if your goal is to fish longer in the day before your, your shoulder gives out, then yeah, that can help. But really the goal is to fish have a better uh, dead drift run each mm. run um, reaches reaches everything in your own nymphing. Basically what you're trying to do is, you know, as r- rivers run straight, but your arm moves in an arc, right? Mm-hmm. If you have a long rod and a long arm span, you've got a longer arc. But what you're trying to do is to get a good dead drift, you're trying to turn this arc into a line. And just like dra- drawing a line in the sand, if you can reach further and then you articulate and bring your elbow and shoulder in as it gets close to you and then you extend it out as it, as it moves away from you, right? Mm-hmm. If you have longer reach, that line is longer. So that's what you're trying to do in Euronif is maximize that, that, um, that dead drift. Mm. And you can do that better with reach. And uh, with a lighter rig, you can reach better, you can reach longer. That's it. Wow, that's. I think that pretty much summarizes it pretty well. Any uh, any other items you want to give a heads up here before we uh, jump off? I mean, if we look out, say this year, uh, give us a little update there. What what can we expect? Are you, uh, you know, your line? You've got things pretty set up there. Anything new coming for you? Well, uh, this is going to be a uh, pretty exciting uh, year for us because up until now we've been we've been pretty quiet and just trying to you know, cross all our T's and dot all our I's before we, before, uh, we go out, we haven't done any advertising up, up until now. Mm -hmm. And, um, this is the first time anyone outside of the, you know, the company is, is going to be hearing about us. So, um, you know, a little bit more marketing this year to see, uh, to see what the response is. And, uh, yeah, again, we haven't done any marketing. So marketing and visibility, um, community is a big thing. Um, building that community, uh, whether it's with, whether it's with a, uh, ambassador program or more social media, but getting, I guess, more outside users. I think people are probably tired of seeing me catch fish, you know, on our mm. Instagram and, and on, in our videos. So I'd like to get more people outside involved. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, James Park from Red Truck, he does a really oh, yeah. good job. Yeah. yeah. That's his background though. And I, I don't have that background. So, um, my background is product design and development and his is, you know, the social media and and that kind of program. So he does a really good job of getting his outside, all his users, um, Mm -hmm. to, to help post and help promote the product. And I'm not really sure how I'm going to do that, but that, that is something (laughs) I'd like to get to. Yeah. I, I think that, uh, I mean, that's a cool thing I think about people listening here. I know I've talked to a lot of people, you know, that listen to this podcast. And I think whenever we hear of new products, everybody gets excited. Uh, and I think this mm-hmm. one is one of those super unique products that everybody's going to have to at least take a look at. And uh, and then, you know, if we can, get it in their hands so they can test it out and see what we're talking about here. Because um, it doesn't seem like Euro Nymphing is going to be going away anytime soon, right? It seems like it's one of those things that people are really excited about. I mean, do you see the... You've been doing it a while, but do you still see that buzz? People are you know, excited about it. It seems like it's probably one of the most effective ways to catch fish, right? Oh yeah, there's there's no question. I mean, like the concept itself is just so is so simple. Um, there's going to be arguments and there's going to be haters, and I mm-hmm. see more of those lately. Um, but you know, you can't you can't argue with the facts. If you get a fly down deep where the fish is and put it in front of his face, he's yep. going to take it more yep. times than, than hoping that a fish comes up for, for a dry or whatever. Yeah. So or chases a streamer or something like that. Yeah. So there's no question. I do see the Euro nymphing starting to get a little bit more broad. I mean, the basics of Euro nymphing are very specific, you know, it's a short technique. Um, but I can see it expanding more into, um, dry fly techniques and, mm-hmm. uh, long casting techniques and, and things like that. So, and that's why I started this company is I, I see a lot more potential in, in where this is going. And, um, so I feel like, um, I feel like with, 
with regards to product development, I, I do have some other products I'm working on, but um, mm -hmm. uh, I'll continue to, to uh, develop the micro reel. So, you know, um, we'll be ready to roll out the next generation when that, when that time yeah. comes. Um, I see it. I, I see that this concept, the, uh, the low inertia um, lightweight concept getting pushed further, I hope, and maybe rod and reel manufacturers, um, being involved. I'm not just trying to grow this company, but I'm, I'm trying to grow a, a category, mm -hmm. right. Called, called the, the micro reel and the ultralight fly fishing. And again, it only applies mainly to, to Euro nymphing, but Euro nymphing is such a big market right now that, um, you know, I think it has some, some potentials. So, you know, coming up, um, you know, as, as we grow the company, um, in this category, you know, like I'm, I'm happy to discuss and share what I've been working on with industry people, you know, if it, if it something they're interested in developing, mm -hmm. um, whether it's a rod maker or a, or a reel maker. And I think to truly get to where my goal is, in a ultralight system, it's going to take the cooperation of a reel and a rod company. Yeah. Right. right. And I don't know if that's going to be me or if maybe somebody else wanted to step in and say, Hey, you know, we've got the rod technology or we've got the rod experience or we've got the real, ex whatever. But mm -hmm. I, I maybe see the potential of this becoming more of a, you know, a joint, a joint venture. I think up until now, the real people have been doing their thing and the rod people have been doing their thing. Right. Yeah. Right. That's it. No, I love that. That's a good, uh, that's a good call out here because I know there's people listening here that are definitely in the, in the industry, right. And they're connected. So this is a chance for them. Maybe if they haven't heard of this to, uh, or you to connect with you and maybe start a discussion, right. That's, that's part of a, that's where it all starts is just kind of talking. So maybe, maybe we'll help that, right. uh, help get that rolling here. And uh, this has been a lot of fun, Jeff. I think we're going to definitely, obviously, we're going to have you on this whole year. So we're going to have a lot of opportunities to do some other stuff here. But uh, I appreciate you uh, digging in today and shedding some light on it. And we'll we'll send everybody out to uh, Maverick uh, USA. And that's Maverick. It's M-A-V-R-K. Um, and so to maybe to take us out here with the Maverick. So you, you went with the, the cool, unique. I'm not sure even what you call that one. That's Maverick is spelled a little bit differently. But, but what does Maverick mean to you? Why, why that name? Oh, I think that Maverick just means, uh, somebody who's doing things a little bit differently mm -hmm. and, uh, not caring about what other people are, are doing at the time or what people are saying. They're just doing what, what they do. And, um, and that's, that's kind of the whole, the whole thing behind the name. And, um, we have a, we have a subcategory of uh, called Trout Lab mm. and, uh, Trout Lab is, uh, not so much a name of the, the company or, or a product or anything. It's just kind of a mantra we have that. Um, to always remind us that our position in the, in the, in, in this space is to be exploring and to try different things. So if you think about Maverick, um, think about, you know, the guys are trying to do things a little bit differently and push mm -hmm. the envelope, push the package and, um, and, like and that. also just keep, keep things kind of simple and clean, you know, not, not go too crazy with things and make things too overly complicated. Um, you know, just, just sort of explore things that are working and, yeah. So that's where those two names came from, Maverick awesome. and uh, Trout Lab. Yeah, no, I, I think it's perfect. I think I love the Trout Lab. Sounds great as well. It gets you thinking, and uh, and Maverick will. I think that's perfect too. Well, we can't miss the opportunity for a, an old uh, Tom Cruise uh, highlight. So we'll think of uh, Maverick, and we'll <laughs> we'll throw a we'll throw a Top Gun video. We'll see if we can dig something funny up from Tom Cruise back in the, from the old the old <laughs> yeah. Maverick. Uh, but uh, anyway, so this has been good, Jeff. I appreciate again spending some time here today. We'll we'll be in touch with you, and I uh, just want to thank you for uh, yeah doing what you do and coming out with these new. You know, I mean, the, basically a new idea that nobody's probably ever seen before. So it's pretty awesome to be connected with you here. So we'll talk to you soon. Well, thank you very much for letting me uh, share my story. So there you go. Wetflyswing.com slash 415, 415. You can check out the Stinger Reel. Uh, take a look at some of the videos we're going to include uh, from some of the stuff that Jeff has going on. All the show notes, 415 right now. Quick listener shout out before we get out of here. Dan Mergbarger. Dan reached out and uh, he reached out on email and said uh, he's over in the Snake River area and said we should really get Larry Larson on the podcast. 
who's from Pocatello, and I have since talked to Larry, and it looks like we're going to get him on. He said that uh, Dan was saying that carp smallies, giant trout, is something that the snake is known for, and, uh, and Larry would be a great guest. So thanks, uh, thanks, Dan, for checking in. We will definitely work on getting Larry on the podcast. Appreciate your support as well for this podcast. If you want to get a shout out right now, you can send me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com. All right, I'm going to take it out of here with the trip. We got the big trip we are doing. We are giving it away right now as we speak. This is like midway. We got a weekend coming up, and then it's going to wrap up quickly. So if you want to get a shot to fish the Henry's Fork with me and one of the best Euro nymphing uh, guides in the country, you can check out right now. Um, you can enter that giveaway, wetflyswing.com slash giveaway. Uh, but not only that, we're going to have a bonus day where we're probably going to be fishing some below the surface. But if there's some hatches going on, we're going to be we're going to be dialing that in as well. The Henry's Fork, the South Fork of the Snake, two of the best rivers. We're going to be staying at an epic lodge. Uh, this is going to be a hard one to pass up. So if you are interested, enter that giveaway. But also if you want to just get involved in one of these six slots we have available, uh, drop me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com. And I'll let you know if we still have availability. Uh, let's get on it. If you're interested, if you want uh, to learn, if you've been really curious about taking your Euro game to the next level, learning from one of the best, uh, we got Pete Erickson on to take us there on this one. And I'm going to be learning as well on the way. So I'd love to meet you on the river. Definitely, if I can't, check in with me online. And uh, I hope you, I hope you are having a good evening, a good morning or good afternoon wherever you are in the world and i appreciate you for checking in today thanks for listening to the wet fly swing fly fishing show for notes and links from this episode visit wetflyswing.com